The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. I want to talk about uh, this subject of discontinuity regions in walls, and I'll explain what they are in just a moment. Uh, and, and definitely take my recommendations and use them only with a lot of judgment uh, when I get to the end. But uh, we'll, we'll try and, and have something practical come out of this. Uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois in the late 1970s, Jim White was already a legend among the students, and I never had a chance to meet him. I think the first time might have been when our advisor, mentor, uh, Meta Sosen, set us up on a project to go to Viña del Mar after the 1985 Chile earthquake. And uh, we went with uh, Dr. Wood, who was uh, recently graduated also uh, from the University of uh, Illinois. And uh, we went down under the, the guise of a project to study uh, what happened to several buildings uh, in the, the earthquake that occurred in 1985. Uh, the other earthquake, the, the, the earthquake everybody remembers from 1985, I think maybe uh, the Mexico earthquake. But I remember this one because I went with Jim White. And Jim took a liking to a particular kind of building. Uh, and you know, this was one example of them, the Angaroa. And uh, the building might be characterized as one that has staggered wall openings. And Jim was wondering, you know, how, how does this thing work in some buildings and not work in other buildings? What, what are the behavior mechanisms associated with these kinds of walls? And uh, this one uh, did reasonably well, but it did have some significant damage uh, you know, these wall layouts, uh, opening layouts, are kind of interesting because you can imagine struts going down diagonals and ties. And if you thought about a, a, a strut and tie model, which I don't think we were thinking about back then, it almost looks like it should have perfect layout for such a thing. But uh, it also has a zipper uh, vertically uh, in some locations. And some of these walls unzip. There are some other buildings that uh, were kind of like this as well, but they performed quite well. So Jim uh, came back and was interested in this subject and did a research project on walls with staggered openings and comparing those walls with solid walls. And you know, this configuration of openings was very much like another building. I, it started with the letter A, Alma something. I can't remember. Yeah, some, Alma Drow. Almadral, some, something like that, that uh, performed very well. And, and Jim wanted to find out why did it do so well. So he ran a series of laboratory tests uh, with the student Ali and uh, published the, the work in a 1991 ASCE journal paper. Uh, the walls actually did perform quite well. The, the walls with the staggered openings uh, were generally good performers, but at some point uh, in loading uh, from right to left with the opening of the doorway close to the flexural compression zone, there was too much compression and shear in those elements and they blew out. Uh, but not until the drift ratios were pretty good. Uh, the, the numbers and the details don't matter so much. And I had kind of forgotten about this until the 2010 Chile earthquake. And uh, several of us went back uh, to look at wall buildings after this event. And we found many buildings with this kind of a characteristic damage. Uh, so there would be a, a shear wall uh, with uh, openings that were vertically aligned. These were the most common kind of building to find. And uh, these openings were for hallways that separated apartment units or condominium units on either side of the hall. And typically, these openings would end 
up at the top in a machine room, so there'd be a solid wall segment up at the top, and they might end down at the bottom in another solid segment uh, where the occupancy changed a little bit. And uh, in several examples of these buildings, not, not every one, of course, but several examples we saw that uh, at the base, uh, that solid wall panel got chewed up very badly. And in some cases up at the top, it also got chewed up. And it's that discontinuity region that I wanted to spend just a little bit of your time talking about. Uh, it got me thinking that I must have seen this somewhere before. And I remember seeing this uh, in some other buildings. But we'll get to that in a second. Uh, these kinds of panel zones, and we have a series of openings, and then there's a, a solid segment that stops or terminates these, occurs in a couple of walls sitting on basement walls, uh, like the one we just saw. Uh, we find them in uh, cases where cantilevered walls land on basement walls. It's just like a giant beam column joint in that case. So maybe the, the shear problem jumps out at you when you see this one. Uh, it occurs in buildings where there are subterranean levels, and the moment is taken out primarily with a couple that comes through the floor diaphragm at the grade level and the slabs below. So you get this panel zone again. And for taller buildings, even though this one isn't taller in the screen, but for taller buildings we sometimes get outriggers and the outriggers have the same kind of thing going on. Uh, where I first saw this uh, was in a building in 1989. And uh, this uh, was in the, after the Loma Prieta earthquake. And this was a, a building I can't name. Uh, even 25 years later, I don't dare name this building. Uh, but uh, in this building, uh, there was this characteristic damage down in the first level underneath the stack of openings. And if we look at the, the detail, the detail that was used in the building is, is very much like we find in many of these kinds of buildings. You know, the, the engineer sets up the computer model with e-tabs or some other software, and there's a solid zone. Does it work? I can't see it. Uh, but there's a, a solid zone down here, so this gets modeled as a single element. And a solid piece here, and suddenly it, it breaks into two, and so you've got two elements being modeled. And there's moment requiring boundary steel at these two inner courts. When you get down to section two, this steel is no longer required, at least according to many computer software that uh, would analyze the system. So it's quite common for the engineer to extend the bars down at development length, cut them off, done. And unless you model this in some more detail, you just don't see the shear that's down there. And of course, the, the problem uh, in retrospect is kind of an obvious one, I think. Uh, you have the, the two boundaries of these coupled walls that land on this common zone, this panel zone. But you know, these uh, elements land on this solid wall. There's a uh, bond stress that has to be transferred between the bars and the surrounding concrete. Uh, as the architects like to say about this principle of structural justice, the, the strongest and stiffest elements are the ones that take the load. So the load doesn't go out to the sides. It, it gets transferred straight across in this little panel. And uh, the problem that this, or this causes in the panel uh, is, is to me almost apparent when I think about the shear flow on this little panel in here. Very commonly, there's a floor slab up at the top that provides reinforcement that can drag out the horizontal shear up at the top. There's nothing down at the bottom in most of these cases. So it's it's. it's uh, incomplete design actually looking down here. And sometimes the stresses can get very high in these zones. Now, uh, Santiago Pujol, who's a co author on this paper with me, uh, was visiting Berkeley for a while last year and he said, Let's study this. It looks like an interesting problem. And Santiago had done some tests at Purdue, which I'm not going to present here. Uh, but as part of this study, we, we decided, let, Let's see if we can figure out some resistance mechanisms for this. And so one idea of a resistance mechanism is very simply the tension and compression cords come down. They create the vertical shears along the faces AD and BC. 
keep this in equilibrium, there's got to be horizontal shear, so you've got to have some uh, cords that drag the shear forces out horizontally as well. And uh, that's one way of thinking about the resistance mechanism, a series of cords with a shear panel inside. Uh, the second way that w we found engineers interested in modeling this was with a strut and tie model. So that's another alternative of how this could be done. And uh, we asked several people, in, including Professor White, how should we do this? And we got many answers back, but no really conclusive answers on how to consider the strength of this kind of element. And so we went back to some very simple, basic principles, uh, kind of using this lower bound theory or lower bound solutions from plasticity theory. Uh, if we look at a panel zone, this was courtesy of Mike Collins, uh, and think about the panel having shear applied around the boundary and maybe some axial compression, which might occur in some of these panels. If you just take a cut along a crack, a naive, simple solution is that the uh, shear along the face BC uh, has to be balanced by the tension forces in the horizontal reinforcement, assuming no force between cracks. And the shear along the face AB is picked up by the vertical steel plus whatever vertical stress there might be. And you can solve this to, for, for the angle or you can solve it for the shear strength. And this very simple solution comes out, uh, just the left-hand part of this, not the inequality. And this solution's been around for a long time. I, I kind of rediscovered it by accident one day. Uh, but I find out it's been around for 30 or 40 years. Just, I don't hear anybody talk about it ever. Uh, and then the folks who test these kinds of panels say you should never go over about 0.25 F prime C for your shear stress. That's kind of an upper limit on these things. And so uh, we went to uh, one of Mike Collins' papers, a simplified modified compression field theory, which wasn't so simple in my thinking. Uh, but <laughs> we pulled out all the data that we could find here uh, that had uh, <coughs> test panels that had horizontal and vertical reinforcement satisfying the minimum of what the ACI building code would require, including uh, tests with axial load and without. And he so said, let's try this solution. And wow, it really worked great. We were so impressed with this. And then when we discovered that somebody had come up with this solution 40 years ago, we were even more impressed. A little disappointed, maybe, but very <laughs> impressed. And Santiago said, oh, what about trying another formula for the shear strength? And he says, how about what ACI 318 already says about squat shear walls? And I thought, it can't possibly work. But here's three roots F prime C plus the minimum of the horizontal or the vertical steel times Fy, not to exceed 0.25 F prime C. Measured strength versus calculated. Pretty darn good. So here's one solution. Here's the other. One is about as good as, as the other one. And this one is so simple, why not stick with it? Because everybody knows it already. So uh, we came back and looked at this building. And the building uh, is quite remarkable in the sense that it, it actually, in each boundary, it had 21 number 18 bars. It was a setup for failure. It was a real guarantee to have something go wrong here. And uh, we said, well, you know, the simple way to calculate the shear stress in this panel is something like 80 to 90 percent of the force that comes in from the boundary steel is resisted in this little panel. It's, it's pretty close to what you find from nonlinear analyses. So 80% of it times the area of the steel times 1.25 times the yield strength is the force. And that gets spread over the length of the development to, and across the thickness of the wall. And so 2300 PSI is what you get here, 0.32 F prime C. It's, it's above the 0.25 limit that you probably think was reasonable and way above the, the amount of steel that was provided. The, the steel that was provided wouldn't provide any strength close to this. So to me, it wasn't so surprising that this thing failed. Uh, turns out, uh, miracle of miracles, uh, 25 years after the earthquake, I found the five and a quarter inch floppy disk with the instrumental records uh, from the building. And we were able to read it. And it's quite remarkable that 
uh, you know, we can follow uh, the displacement traits from the roof, and uh, we can count zero crossings or use other methods to estimate the period. And right about somewhere around 12 seconds, the amplitude increases, the vibration period apparently increases. And I'm not going to bore you with the results of some nonlinear dynamic analysis results, but we get, we're able to get pretty close to this if we tune things up about right. And somewhere around in this zone here is where we calculate the stresses in this panel zone get above what we think the strength is. And so it all seems to make sense. And so I'm just going to conclude very simply from a very simple set of field tests that we saw. And, and this will take me a couple minutes to get through. But uh, we think that there's a simple way to, to approach the design of these things. Uh, if you've got a panel zone like this or panel zones like the others that I showed, uh, the shear stress or force can be calculated pretty easily, we think. Most of the shear that comes in from these bars gets dumped into this panel. And so the shear force is pretty easily calculated. Uh, so this is the force, not the stress. Uh, the stress capacity can be estimated pretty well just using the ACI method for a squat wall. Nothing new there. Uh, we think that under uh, dynamic loading, reverse cyclic loading from an earthquake, uh, and especially con considering some of the geometries where somebody might try to use something like this uh, against my recommendation to you, don't follow my recommendation, uh, we think this stress limit ought to be a little bit lower for reverse cyclic loading. And uh, so we suggest a little bit lower stress. And uh, if you want to keep the demand less than the apparent capacity, you have to extend the steel down at least far enough to get the stress down to where you can resist the, the forces. Now, uh, we had guessed, and some of the analyses that we've run, and again, I won't show, uh, that the steel that enters this panel even if you extend it down further, it gets developed within the development length. And so all that force gets dumped into that panel no matter how long you make these bars. And so uh, you have to provide confining steel to make this thing somewhat ductile so it won't just explode and come apart so that it'll maintain some load capacity. And so one can continue to resist force in shear here and drag the load even deeper into the element. And that's my recommendation of how these things ought to be designed. Jim, what do you think? Are you extending the confinement steel too? Uh, I, would, I would put the confinement steel down as far as I thought the force needed to be transferred. And you've got continuous bars at the bottom also? You mean way down here? No, no, no. no. Uh, that, that was the floor level. You know, I, I, I don't think you should cut off any bars until you get in at least one floor level so you've at least got the horizontal force capacity to drag the load out in two floors. You should, should never cut the steel off up here. Anyway, that's, that's the thought that Santiago and I had. And uh, we'd like to leave with the audience today to think about. Thanks.